Hello, everyone, and welcome to Creative Live. I'm your host, Kenna Klosterman, and we are here on Creative Live TV for another episode of our podcast, We Are Photographers, where we take you behind the scenes with photographers, filmmakers, industry greats from all over the world. And we talk about what it means to live a creative life, uh, the ups and the downs, the wins and the struggles, uh, so that we all know that we are not alone in this creative journey. Uh, so before we bring on our guest today, Noemi Marguerite, I would love to find out where it is that you are tuning in from. Let me know how you're doing today. Um, we are a community, like I said, of all over the world and just wanna hear from you, how you're doing and again, where you are tuning in from. So whether you are watching on Creative Live social media channels or right here on creativelive.com slash TV, where you'll see a chat icon and you can click on that, jump in and um, interact with folks throughout the day. So again, welcome to Stephanie, to Dave and keep those coming in. We've got uh, Stephanie is in. North Carolina in a rural town, uh, Castle Hain, uh, and we've got Phoenix and keep them coming. All right, everybody. Well, uh, without further ado, I am super excited to bring to Cradle Live for the very first time, Noemi Marguerite. Noemi is a photographer and filmmaker. Uh, she does incredible personal projects in addition to her editorial and commercial work. Uh, she has been featured, her work has been featured in Wired, New York Times, Fast Company, Vogue, Harper's Bazaar. Uh, she's <laughs> featured as one of the 2021 Creative Club Class, which is presented by the Creative Collective New York. Um, she is a visual artist, a revolutionary, um, and I'm just super excited to, to bring her to you and talk about her career and all that she has learned. So please give it up. Give me some <laughs> applauses from all over the world for Noemi. Noemi, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. This is exciting. <laughs> Well, we are excited. And I was just saying this before we started. You have the best smile. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate it. So, uh, Noemi, let's start by right, right before we started, and I'm looking over, seeing some more people come in. Uh, we've got Switzerland, Montana, Texas. Uh, awesome. Keep them coming. Uh, so, uh, right before we get, got started, um, mm -hmm. right, we were talking about, you know, you you are, of the many things that you do, um, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get to the photography and filmmaking, <laughs> but uh, talking about uh, you wanting to speak more and yeah. um, more speaking engagements. And I know I've been seeing your name pop up in a number of speaking engagements, kind of <laughs> how I saw you and wanted to bring you on, mm -hmm. diving into your work and your filmmaking. But um, what what is it about... Um, you know, about your experiences or that, mm -hmm. what is the, the motivation behind wanting to continue to, to speak and share? Yeah. Um, it's probably because I now have a better understanding of what I'm experiencing and who I am as a person. Um, cause with photography that started when I was 14 and in, in middle school and I hated writing then, um, and I couldn't articulate my emotions or anything in that uh, capacity. And so I was just like, let me just use photography as just understanding myself. Um, Cause I watched a lot of films and I actually wanted to be a director, um, still do. And so it was like, let me just create these like still lives of my life. So it was my way of informing myself to myself. Um, Cause I was really heavy on self portraiture and now fast forward, it's like, I started therapy last year. I always talk about therapy and now I can put into words what was going on. Um, Cause I couldn't. And now that I can explain it, it's like, all right, let me explore how that looks like and what that feels like and how it's connected to my professional work as well. So I'd love to hear more. Um, mm -hmm. I, 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 um, we, uh, as I was talking about earlier, I also believe in this time, it is, um, we are in March, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, where are we? March, yeah. 2021, um, still, you know, still in the midst of, of the pandemic. And, uh, you know, when we, when we 
we are infused into our work. Um, mm-hmm. And even if it's for, you know, clients or whatever, I believe that as artists, as, as, as visual communicators, mm-hmm. like there, it's always a sort of a two way. And I, and I really feel that um, in your work, um, mm-hmm. sort of this, that whether it's the color or whether it's the sort of the, the interaction between you and what's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and so how do you think that how you are sort of interacting with the world or what you're sort of where you are, um, mm-hmm. personally and emotionally is, 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 is seen into, into that work? Um, I mean, it's, it's all connected, you know, I, I am an emotional person, <laughs> naturally. Um, I am also sensitive as well. And yeah, art just plays such a huge role in my life. Like I listen to music all the time. Like I mentioned, I watch movies all the time. And it's, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of hard to leave art the way it is. I think it's important to incorporate context. Um, I'm really big about adding context to the gray areas of life, which is essentially life. I think people view, I think we view ourselves in a a black and white spectrum where it's like, you can only be X or, or Y, you know? And I'm coming to understand that we are much more fluid than that. There's a lot that we don't consider in our day to day and just how we treat ourselves and how we treat others. And so I, yeah, I'm like hoping my work provides a level of like a a range that people can be affirmed by where it's just like, Oh, I can look like this and be like this and do these things and also feel that. And also, you know what I mean? And so I think that's where all of that's coming from. It's, I, I want to, I want to um, go into some uh, projects that you're doing in, in a little bit, but go, mm-hmm. going into the work of the, so you do stills, but then you mm-hmm. also do um, create storytelling, create visuals in, in mm-hmm. a very unique way. And that's what I call, you know, visual poetry is kind of mm-hmm. the word I, I, I really identified with in terms of titling, you know, this conversation or, or what have you, but this, the, on your Instagram and your IGTV and Vimeo, um, people can go and see these, um, their, their vignettes, there's mm-hmm. video, there's words, there's music. Um, mm-hmm. and, and it's very personal, mm-hmm. uh, and, and yet, um, universal in terms of what what we're all experiencing Mm -hmm. so can you sort of describe um creating these or the intention behind Mm -hmm. yeah so the the video series I guess I can call it it's called mental traffic um which was the title of my tumblr that I made in high school um and it's a private tumblr but I would just write you know anything that I was feeling and I looked back at it last year and I just saw how angry I was. Um, And I was like, wow, like I just, I, I knew I was going through a lot at that time, but I didn't really register how angry I was. And, you know, with the pandemic, it just, it hit me a lot. And I experienced the depression I didn't experience in a very long time. I think prior to that, my last you know, depressive episode was 2015. Um, And so I had to just figure out how to maneuver within myself. I journal a lot. I've been journaling since 2015. And I kind of leaned in towards poetry. And I'm like, let me just try this out and, you know, be intentional with words and like figure out how to use words creatively. And so that in juxtaposition with my therapy sessions and just like sitting with my emotions, I was kind of like, I need to just get this out. Um, And so that's where those short clips come from, where it's just small snippets of my writings that I have in my journal that I just pick out randomly. Um, And I always make sure to create those pieces once I've finally concluded what I was experiencing at that time. So I never share anything while I'm still in it um, because the internal healing has to complete first 
I don't think the creative aspect should be a part of that process because then you're incorporating how people will receive it, their commentary. And so I create that boundary to make sure, am I good in this space? Am I cool? Yes. Okay, cool. I can do that, that bonus. Um, so yeah, that's what it's about. I, I just want people to not be afraid of themselves or be embarrassed or feel shame. Like my biggest struggle was going through and maneuvering shame. Um, and once you remove that, it's just, it's just a lot easier. Um, so I always want to push that narrative first and foremost for myself, but it is awesome that other people can feel that too. I, I, I believe that, and, and, you know, talking with, with so many creatives, um, over, over the years, I mean, it's, we almost lean more <laughs> towards having the, the uh, sensitivity and, and, um, you know, just, and, and that, um, struggle. And mm-hmm. I personally, you know, have experienced depression and anxiety for, for a long time. Mm-hmm. And so it's, um, it's this, you know, oscillation between, like you said, understanding, um, when you're in it and how to capture that, you know, but the, the fact that you are utilizing your art mm-hmm. as a healing tool, I mm-hmm. think is, um, something that's incredibly, uh, important for everybody right now, mm-hmm. as, especially at this time. Um, Mm -hmm. so I just, I, I see it as a really beautiful example, um, for, for people and resonating with, with people. Yeah. Uh, so thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. Let's, uh, talk about your, um, uh, aside from the personal projects and we'll keep Mm -hmm. going there, but, uh, the, the professional work, um, Mm -hmm. you are a self-employed, um, professional, uh, and, and let's talk about, you know, in looking at your work, it ranges from the editorial portraiture, Mm -hmm. um, with portraiture for branding, um, Mm -hmm. as well as events. And of course, then there's the videography as well. So, Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your, your journey um, and, mm-hmm. and getting to where you are today. Yeah, my journey is really insane. Um, I So like I mentioned, I, I started taking photographs in middle school, in high school. I was in yearbook. Um, and the biggest things were candids. Like, we always had to take candids. And so I would have my camera on me all the time. And so that's probably the starting point into just capturing day to day or things that may be overlooked. And then in college, I actually wanted to major in graphic design, but it was really competitive and I didn't get in. And I remember crying outside in the rain because I was just devastated. I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. So I ended up doing information systems because I did coding in high school. And so I'm like, okay, I can continue on with that. And then on the side, I would take, I would still take photographs of my friends, definitely wanted to highlight, you know, college life. And then I also did graduation photos as like a side hustle. Um, And so then graduated, it's kind of like unemployed slash contracting doing brand design work. And again, that's that's why my second depression hit, because I'm just like, I don't know what I'm doing but I really wanted to be involved with the arts. Um, and I knew New York was a part of my journey. Like I came to New York for the first time in college. Um, cause I won a, an award and yeah, as soon as I landed, I started crying and I'm like, why am I crying? Why am I emotional? Um, but I was just like, yeah, I have to be here. So ended up taking the leap. I moved here in August of 2017 Landed a a gig at um, a startup. I was a brand designer there and then got laid off a year later. But during my time when I was working there, I was still going to different events, you know, networking. Um, And I always had my camera on me because I noticed that was an icebreaker. And that was just for me to meet people. Um, But people were just like, oh, and there would be moments where they would give me media passes. And they're like, oh, do you want one? I'm like, okay, cool. So then when I got laid off a year later in 2018, I ended up shooting an event that got on Vogue.com the next day. And then I shot Pierre Moss that weekend backstage just for free because I wanted to test the waters. And I'm like, all right, let me just try this. 
And so I've been self-employed since 2018. Um, and it's been insane because every opportunity that I've gotten has been through referrals. Um, I've, I haven't done any pitching yet. I would love to at some point, but it's just been through word of mouth and it's just, and I, I have people ask me like, you know, how are you able to work with these companies and these businesses? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Cause I don't, you know, I, I create a lot of personal work. Um, and I think it starts there. I just, I keep doing things on my own and just put it out. Um, but then I also, I'm very like personable. And so when I'm meeting you, I don't mention that I'm a photographer because I don't want to talk about that. I don't want, I want to understand you as a person first. And then if over in our conversation, there's a connection to where it's like, oh, we may work together or we're interested in the same things, then cool, let's introduce that. But I never bring that up. Um, and it's fascinating because even in those processes, if there's people that know of me in those conversations, they actually bring it up themselves. And then that kind of creates this thought process in the, the companies or the brands are just like, why didn't she even promote herself to me? You know, it's like, and so there's this weird mind mess for them, but it's worked. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's never lost on me that the fact that I am doing this full time living in one of the most expensive cities in the country. And it's, it's just been off of being myself and trusting the process. Um, so yeah, it's, it's crazy. Well, I, I'm hearing some, some things that I think are, are common and I want to, you know, highlight because mm -hmm. for everybody out there, you know, is that putting out your personal work, mm -hmm by far, it seems to be what people get hired for. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's one thing for people to see your, you know, your portfolio work. Um, but to your point, when people see that they connect with you, they connect with mm -hmm. you as the artist and that's what they're really hiring, not necessarily your past work. I mean, they go in tandem, but, um, yeah, so, no. So it's cool to hear you say that that is, you know, part of, again, how, how the journey is. And, and, and I also want to highlight for people listening, like nobody's journey is going to be the same. So, right. you know, going from wherever, you know, you were to, I'm looking at your portfolio online and you're hanging out with common doing like a photo <laughs> session in his house. Like, right. Yeah. Better. Like, yeah. so, um, so, so I mean, you know, Talk to me about that experience, if you can. Yeah, no, I, yeah, totally. Um, so I that was for a music video, and I was shooting, I was in charge of BTS, and the director of the video, Sade, I met her. So, okay, the day I got laid off at my startup, I actually had a gig lined up that later that day for Spotify, in which it was to document um, three black women who won like this podcast award or grant or something. Sade was one of them. And I saw her again at like the ceremony that happened months later. And then she kept in contact and then reached out to me and was just like, Hey, I love your work. Would love for you to be BTS. And yeah, um, that was, it's always surreal, mostly just because I, I love the process of things. So being able to see the cameramen and the gaffers and just like everybody working on this. And I'm like, I'm one of these people. Like I just never, I never thought I would be on a set, you know, like I never really expected that. And so, yeah, it was an awesome experience. Um, common is super nice. Um, and it worked out. And you're out. working with Sade. I mean, yeah, Sade. Come amazing. on. <laughs> she is amazing. Um, and she, like, she's directed, um, like, Madewell commercials. She's directed. She's just an amazing individual. Um, so, yeah. And, and 
I think it's interesting. You're, you're saying, you know, I'm interested in the process. You mentioned earlier you were, you, you know, directing is one of the things that you're interested in or are you're already doing. What am I saying? Mm-hmm. Interested in you're already directing <laughs> your own films and, yeah. and sets and stills. So we'll, we'll get to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, um, the value of be of seeing it, does that make it more real? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a huge pinch me moment where it's like, you know, whenever they say quiet on set and you just see it and it's just like, and they do it again. And it's like, all right, we're, we're changing. And it's just like, because I'm naturally a fly on the wall, it's a very out of body experience for me where I can't even see myself in that moment. Um, but yeah, it's just crazy how um, within reach it is for me and how accessible it is, um, which is another thing that I want to work on expressing to people how like your impossible is actually pretty possible um, because I am living in my impossible world and it's very surreal. Let's go further on that because I think that's super important. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, um, as you know, when, when as somebody who you know, when not somebody, we all you know go through these waves. Mm-hmm. Um, we talked about self worth, self doubt. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's it's easy for things to seem impossible. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've seen you talking about the, you know the concept of of abundance. Um, mm-hmm. And so talk to us a little bit more about your your outlook on on that because it can be very you know inspirational to be reminded of yeah um so just to provide context so I had a really intense like panic attack disorder in high school and I would have my first panic attack was on my 16th birthday and I'm like what is going on your heart's racing and then it like I was just experiencing so much anxiety I just had so much anger because I'm like, there was just a lot of internal conflict. I wasn't happy with the way I looked. I wasn't happy with what was going on in my life. And so when I was 17, like a couple days after my birthday, I actually attempted suicide. And it, I like suppressed that memory so much that it came back two years ago. And I was just like, why have I never thought about this, went through this, like discussed this with myself. And I, it's just, it's insane because I remember being in high school, really thinking my life was going to be one where I wasn't happy with. Um, Like I'm going to marry someone I don't love. I want to have kids because I'm expected to. And then I'm just going to be miserable. And Um, I created a a video called 10 years later, that was 10 years after the attempt when I turned 27. And in that process, um, I actually stumbled on a home video footage of my 10 year old self giving myself like a pep talk. And like, it's, I'm talking about things about, you know, Hey, if you feel fat, that's okay. Like there's nothing wrong with being fat. Or, you know, stand up for yourself and all these things. And the weirdest part of it is at the end of that clip, I'm singing myself happy birthday, but it wasn't my birthday. And so the fact that I saw that footage around the time of reaching 27, the alignment of that was just like, okay, this was, this was actually supposed to happen. Um, And so I'm really... I just, I have a very soft spot for individuals, which I feel is like all of us who feel like we are at the end, like there, it just, it can't get better. Like this is just, you know, there's no way it's happening to everyone. I'm the exception. Um, and you know, at the end of my 10 years later clip, I end it by saying, you know, I don't know why I didn't do follow through with what I did, but I think after seeing this footage of my younger self, I realized it was her. And it's like speaking to that inner child that we all have, like just tuning in to that innocence and that curiosity. And like, that is what has kept me going where I'm just like curious about life, curious about myself. Um, Even with the pandemic, I'm like, I'm not working. 
And so maybe like, this is just my time to rest. Maybe this is the time where I actually have to face a lot of things that I thought I was over with. Um, and just really keep in tune of like who I am as an individual. Um, and so I'm really, just really, really big about that and looking to just find avenues to continue pushing that narrative. Cause people will see my work in 2019 of working with common and be on vogue.com. And then 2020, I am miserable. And that is literally like, you know, that is the up and down. And in the down, there's still benefits to it. Cause now, you know, I've, I've taken away how much I value rest. Uh, my takeaway is the fact that I have boundaries now and that I want to preserve my peace or I want to be in spaces around people that serve me. And like, I had to go through that shitty shit to be in, you know, the space that I'm in now. So I feel like I was on a tangent, but I hope that answers your question. No, I mean, first, again, I want to acknowledge, you know, thank you for your vulnerability and mm -hmm. sharing all of that, because it's, um, again, I think, you know, just in things that mental health and is something that people don't always talk about. And yeah. I'm a big believer in it's if we don't talk about it, then mm -hmm. you believe you're the only one, right. um, especially again in this in the commu creative community. And so. Um, so thank you uh, for that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I absolutely um, love this the the ten year video. Um, mm -hmm. and, and and again, the acknowledgement of um, we we are our, you know we, we do have these ourselves as children, you know, mm -hmm. when that we do need to acknowledge and understand the pain or you know whatever everything that we were going through as a child and that emotion mm -hmm. and everything so you know processing all of that and using art to process all of that right um is um is incredibly valuable um mm -hmm. tool mm -hmm. um let's talk about directing mm -hmm. and like self-directing um mm -hmm. You like you you mentioned you do a lot of self portraits um, mm -hmm. and and again a lot of the you know the 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 visual poetry the these the narratives um, that you're creating mm -hmm. um, and creative direction as well um, so yeah. so there's one thing you you know you talk about um, capturing something that's going on and, yeah. and a vision of that and then there's another thing of like having the concept and mm -hmm. um bringing that to life how did you start doing that for yourself and mm -hmm. then um and then I want to talk to sort of the studio sessions that you you know created that into a business I guess mm -hmm. yeah um yeah I would say it, it pretty much started on how I started photography because I wanted to watch my life the way I watch movies but it's not like I wanted to make my life a movie. It was just like, I just noticed that how I was observing, you know, I started watching like indie films, um, in middle school and they were just really raw and authentic and like, or like movies like little miss sunshine. That was the first movie I cried. And, um, and I always bring this up, but like there's a part where they're having dinner and they have different cups, you know, at the dinner table. And like that detail still sticks with me. Cause it's like, that's my family. Like, you know, we don't have matching glasses all the time. Sometimes someone has a Chuck E. Cheese cup. My dad's going to have the same. Like, and so I, I appreciated that authenticity and I wanted to continue that with myself. And I also wanted to be honest with myself. And so in the creation process, it's weird because I don't necessarily storyboard anything it just kind of comes together. Um, I, I make sure not to force anything in the process when I'm making something. So usually if I hear a song and it clicks, I'm like, okay, I'm going to just save this for later. And I just, I will know when I need to use it. That's the only thing I tell myself. I know when I need to use it. Um, and so I think my most recent one is uh, The Depressed Girl Has Friends, which is something that I wrote in August of last year. Um, and then I received my super eight film footage that I shot throughout that time. 
And I'm like, okay, that was connected. Like, you know, it's just, it, it, it's really like this alignment thing. It's not really a planned thing. It's just like, I know when it works and when it doesn't. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my process with that. Well, I think you said it earlier, the, the just trusting in the process. Mm -hmm. And so, like you said, okay, this song, I know I'm going to use it at some point. Don't know Mm -hmm. when, Mm -hmm. but but if you hadn't necessarily like noted that, Mm -hmm. saved it and been intentional about it, Mm -hmm. uh, then maybe it would have, you know, it wouldn't have come back to you. Right. Uh, I, that word intention, I mean, your, your kind of your statement under your Instagram <laughs> is, uh, you know, I, I'm an artist and I'm intentional about my stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, talk, talk to me about that as a, actually it's, I'm intentional about my shit and it's mm-hmm. trademarked. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is. <laughs> talk to me about, I'm an artist and I'm intentional about my shit. <laughs> yeah. I, so it's a play on words with Erica Badu's quote, which is, I'm an artist and I'm sensitive. And yeah, I, I think it came to me once I noticed how people would come to me asking for a specific type of work or the things that they would point out in my work that I didn't realize they actually caught on. I was just, because as I just mentioned, it's like nothing's really planned and yet there is a consistency in my unplanned work. There is a pattern, there's a theme. So I have to at least acknowledge there is a level of intention in everything that I do, even though it's not structured in that way. And so um, I had to take a step back and kind of analyze like how I go about my processes and even with studio sessions, I know we're going to talk about that. Like there's a a questionnaire that I ask each client to fill out where it's like, how comfortable are you in front of the camera? What's your style? What are you looking for? Just so I can get to know them. You know, I don't want to approach a studio session in the same fashion because each person is different. I want to make sure that I'm being specific to you. I want to make sure I'm being intentional about what you want to see in yourself, what you enjoy, how I'm able to like how I'm able to approach you. Do you like having directions asked? Do you know what you're already doing? It's like it just makes it as specific as possible just because we all have our own lanes. Um, and that's another thing that I also want people to remember is just like it may feel like a saturated industry, but it's not because we're different people. We're literally different people. Like there is no way people can have too much of me or too much of my style because it's just me. And so, yeah, that's, that is where that phrase comes, comes from. It is trademarked. I made sure to do that. I was like, this feels like it's something I should keep to myself. So, but yeah, that's where that comes from. I love it. I love that, the the, the, yeah, I mean that's uh, the trademark is awesome, mm-hmm. <laughs> and thank you, Erica Badu. Love yeah. her. Yeah. Um, studio sessions. So, yeah. is this how long have you been um, doing these, or you know, tell us a little bit about the sort of the business model for other photographers out there? Yeah. So, studio sessions was a concept um, I thought about in 2018 and started January 2019. So essentially, my goal was one, to just practice studio photography. Everything I had done was outdoors or in certain venues, but I'm like, I want to have a blank canvas, essentially. Um, And then two, I wanted to practice directing people because the majority of my work was events. So I don't have to say much, I can shoot and go. With studio sessions, it's really intimate where I'm able to practice on how to communicate, understand different communication styles. Um, Because sometimes when you say, look out the window, someone can literally do this. When it's like, no, I needed to say, move your head. You know what I mean? So just small, like, like tilt your head this way or just move your eyes. Keep. So that's what I'm, I'm still practicing it. Um, So those were my goals. And then it was also like, I just started this full-time photography, I need money. 
Um, and so I did like a, not necessarily a casting call, but it was a casting call where I had a very, I only charged to cover overhead costs of like a studio rental. I had six women come in back to back. I had a friend of mine assist me and it was my test run. It was like, okay, how did it work to have back to back clients? And I did not like that noted. How long do the shoots take on average? About one hour. Okay. I don't need more than that. So it was like a, a really trial and error situation. And so the model is, and I, I just updated it now, but you sign up and like I mentioned, you fill out this questionnaire, you know, how comfortable you are, very comfortable, not comfortable. That informs you like, okay, someone who may be insecure about certain parts, make sure to ask them, hey, what, what about you that you like? Is there a certain angle that you enjoy? Um, because your client needs to be comfortable. Like they don't need to be a model. They just need to be comfortable. And that's something that I always emphasize prior to my shoots because people feel like they have this intimidation of, oh, I need to do this and I know how to, I need to know how to pose. It's like, nope, you just be yourself. Um, and that's how I approach myself. Um, another question I ask is, you know, what's their color style? Do they wear colors? Do they wear neutrals? Um, I like incorporating props into my shoots. And so um, if they say that they love yellow, I might include a yellow chair into the shoot. Um, what else do I ask? I ask what it's for, what they're hoping to cover. And then I also ask, you know, what brands that they like, and it could be anything. And my only, the reason I ask that is to gauge their aesthetic or what they, what they're attracted to, you know? So if they say Zara versus PacSun, you know, you're able to distinguish, you know, which one is like, Zara is very minimal, classy. Paxton is fun, you know, surfer. So it's just to get an idea to create that language of what do you like? Because sometimes clients don't know how to express that. Um, so yeah, I've been doing it. It's been great. It's been a learning experience. Um, I recently increased my price for that just because um, I was so nervous to do it. And then I instantly had seven people sign up. So Okay, like, let's talk. Let's talk about yeah, this. Let's yes, talk about please. this for everyone out there because, I mean, pricing ourselves is the worst. It is. <laughs> I hate it. Yes. <laughs> because we attach this, like, ourselves to our work, and then it's like value, trying to value ourselves, and you know, all of this. And mm -hmm. we hear time and time again, when you increase your prices, it mm. it can often bring in not only not necessarily even more people, but the right people, because you're not even yeah. necessarily trying to do more and more, you know, volume, mm -hmm. it's getting the right people in the door. Mm -hmm. And when you can value your own work at that level, then because mm -hmm. price does, does reflect a value and going back mm -hmm. to brands, like, you know, there's a reason why luxury brands price their stuff at that price, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, even if the cost of goods is the same as something else. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to somebody out there who's scared to raise their prices? Yeah. Um, first, I can relate <laughs> still. <laughs> um, I think what's helped me is I think of cost of living. Um, and I also distinguish, am I interacting with an individual, like just one person, or am I interacting with a company? Obviously with a company, it's going to be a lot more. They have a lot more. They always have more. Um, but I'm like, okay, you know, I, I have bills to pay. I need to eat. I need to do X, Y, and Z. And I know as artists, because we enjoy art making and we enjoy art, it feels weird to price something that we enjoy doing and that we would do for free. And that's, I would say that's the starting point. But the thing is, if this is your job, then it's your job. And um, yeah, I, it's funny cause I recently tweeted a month ago, like, I think I'm okay with being expensive now <laughs> um, because you know, just as I just mentioned, like the intentionality, the experience, like 
people hire me for a specific vision, but then I'm also wanting to have them enjoy that process. I'm also thinking about them. There's also this like exchange of um, interaction where they feel included in it. It's a collaborative e effort, even though I'm photographing this. And so, yeah. And then, which is why I always bring up therapy because it's always connected. I re like I just got to a point where I find myself worthy, like just now. And it's reflected in everything I do, including pricing myself. And it's not a guilt thing. It's not an arrogant thing. It's just like I bring a certain level of quality and I own up to that. And what's insane is that, like I said, I was so nervous to increase my prices but I also see where I want studio, studio sessions to be. And it's elevated. Like I've learned what I wanted to learn in this studio equipment level. There's more equipment that I want to learn how to use. I want to incorporate set design. It's going to cost more. And then also to your point, it's not about quantity. I'm not really concerned about how many people I want people who specifically want me. And you know, I actually had a shoot this past weekend of someone who literally flew from Chicago to New York to book a studio session. And in a saying, pandemic. In a pandemic. pandemic. <laughs> exactly. And it's just like, when I hear that, it's like, okay, you, there's just that connection. It's the same way when you interact with people. Like when you know that people are rooting for you or they're supporting you or they're there for you, it's like, you want that energy. You deserve that energy. You have a right to seek that energy. And it took a very long time for me to like understand and process that. And so I feel like, I mean, at least start above 300 because I know people just want a number. Start above 300 because if you say 150 and you include your lift round trip, you include the time you lost to, you know, do these edits. You include back and forth of, hey, can you fix this? And you realize you're probably at negative 500. It's the worst feeling ever because you can't be like, hey, I actually need more. Um, so if you want a starting point where, yeah, it's still uncomfortable, but it's it's a good start, I would say start at 300. Well, thank you. There's so many, I think the most important nuggets are that, you know, the, the valuing yourself and your work mm -hmm. part. Um, and it, it's so, it can be so connected mm -hmm. to your, your self-worth. And so it's like, there's work to do on both, on both exactly. sides, yeah. but also it's us, you know, it's you recognizing, I heard you say like, oh, wait, I have learned how to do all this studio work. I have, you know, learned, to, it's like, yeah, you got it, that you've invested in your craft mm -hmm. and that's what people value and your style. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about, so thank you. Thank you for sharing all of that. Yeah, um, of course. Color is a big part in, in your work and I've seen that mm -hmm. and heard you talk about that more. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about what, what, color means to you I mean color to me is fascinating from an emotional standpoint mm -hmm. from a mood standpoint um talk to me about color yeah um my love for color definitely started with movies um that was the first thing that I was drawn to like I love the color grade of fight club it's very gritty just green tones and then even seven as well, which I believe are both David Fincher. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know what it was. And like, and it's funny how people point this out now, but you know, when it's a foreign country, there's a certain like warm tone and I've always noticed that. And so I'm like, what is it about color that changes the image? Um, what does it do? How does it enhance? And that was another thing that people would point out in my work. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I do have a particular style and how I color these photos. And so it's, it's just a, a curiosity thing for me. I wish I know there is a psychological connection to it. Um, what reds do, what blues do, what yellows do. 
I'm not quite there yet. I'm kind of like gut feeling about it where it's just like, this is the feeling that I want. And it just so happens to be like an orange hue and et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I just, I really love color usage. Um, I would say uh, if Bill Street could talk is probably my favorite movie from that color standpoint, it's just very vibrant. Um, so yeah, big fan. It, 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 it is such an important aspect. Um, and, and I think, um, gosh, yeah, th just thinking about, you know, Fight Club and what have you, but mm -hmm. um, the, the gut, I think it's interesting you say that the gut is what you go with, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, and then it's, it's kind of easy for, for us to, not easy, but like you're creating a thing and then it's interesting when an outsider can look at it and say, mm -hmm. yep, that's consistent. Whereas yeah. we don't necessarily even like realize that. Mm -hmm. um, how important or how have you sort of sought out community and in terms of like getting that feedback or mm -hmm. you, know, you talked a lot about networking and relationships and, mm -hmm. um, and I know you're, you are, um, I mentioned it earlier, but a part of the designated and, and as an part of the creative class, mm -hmm. uh, 2021, mm -hmm. um, can you talk to us a little bit about the Creative Collective um, New York City, as well as um, just like seeking out community? I know those are yeah. kind of two two separate things, but no, yeah. Um, so the Creative Collective is an amazing group. Um, I remember going to one of their meetings when I was just visiting New York. Um, I was just there at the same time, but they're really big about empowerment amongst the black community and the black creative community where you know that's the other thing it's just like a lot of us don't have parents that are involved with the arts or you know family members or colleagues and you know it's there's just so much that we don't know about and so um that's why it's really important for I, I have a sense of responsibility to share things such as like um pricing yourself or contracts like I recently hired an attorney and it has changed my life and it's like contracts which is something that feels very intimidating but it's essentially an accountability sheet you know this is what you're expecting this is what I'm expecting this is how much I'm doing with what I'm expected vice versa but when you see and think contract you're just like oh my gosh I don't know legal terms I don't know you know and so it's like with the creative collective, like they're just really big on bridging the gap between um, mental health and creativity or finances and creativity, resources and creativity. They have a lot of connections with um, HBO or Netflix or Strong Black Lead and just trying to connect and inform as many people as possible. And, you know, I definitely want to mimic that and mimic that in my personal life with friends that also work in the art industry, specifically photography and film, where we can text each other and be like, hey, you know, they're offering me this much. Does this make sense to you? Or um, a good friend of mine, Justin, I always reach out to him when it comes to inventory. Like, he knows all the gear. Like, I'm not a gear person. Um, I only use Canon because that's what I use in the beginning. Um, but it's just like, hey, I'm kind of looking for this aesthetic. Do you have an idea of what I can accomplish with it? Um, and then even on that same front, it's like, Hey, I'm on this project. Can you cover this aspect? Like, can I hire you for this? Can I bring you on? And so, yeah, it's, it's one of those things where you really, you cannot do this by yourself. You're not expected to do it by yourself and nor you should. Um, so yeah, community is huge. I'm just really big on the informative side, but that's where the mental health aspect comes into play because, people don't take that in consideration. I feel like they don't see the connection on how you handle your day-to-day -day and how that's reflected professionally. So many things I loved in there, uh, but, you know, especially just that we can't do this. We, we don't have to do this alone. Right. Um, and, and that sentiment is, you know, why we have conversations like this, you mm -hmm. know, what, what, what we, um, you know, kind of that, that mission 
behind, you know, champion creatives in whatever aspect of, of life that it is. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, um, congratulations on being part of their mm -hmm. creative class 2021, where, you know, there's, um, acknowledging people who are kind of leading the way. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, having you in different talks and, and things like that, like you said, to, to help encourage others along the way as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. I do have an image that I have to ask you about the experience. <laughs> yes. Cicely Tyson, who, you know, just yeah. passed away in, mm -hmm. in January and mm -hmm. oh, talk to me about the, this experience of, yeah. of, of photographing this amazing group of women. Um, yeah, it was, I was on vacation in January, 2020 and I had my email on, it was like automated out of office. And I saw someone email me about an opportunity and I didn't even know the details, but I'm like, wait, yes, I want to do this. I didn't know the details. I didn't know who was going to be in it, but I think I was just like ready to work again. Um, and so I found out I was photographing um, Felicia Rashad, Cicely Tyson, Brisha Webb and Crystal Fox two days prior. And so once it hit me, I was like, and I mean, with Felicia Rashad, like my, cause I'm Congolese from the Democratic Republic of Congo. I was born in Belgium. And so my siblings and I, I feel like my parents too, but they learned English watching the Cosby show. So like, that is what we watched all the time. Wow. Claire Huxtable was my brother's crush. It's just like, okay. Um, and this is with any shoot. I, I always get nervous before shoots, but I was just like, okay, I got this. Um, I was just in awe the entire time. And there was a portion where, you know, they're doing the interview. And so, you know, everyone's kind of on the side. And Miss Tyson is talking about her mother and how, you know, she would watch her mother leave early in the morning, stand in this line amongst other black women waiting to be chosen possibly to have a job and just like how Miss Tyson just didn't want that for herself. And like, it's just, it was like, and then I also did not know Miss Tyson's mother didn't want her to be an actress. And she mentioned a lot. She's like, if you have this feeling in your heart where you're supposed to be doing something, just follow it. And it just struck me and everyone in the room's crying. <laughs> Like, it was just really, really, really powerful. Um, yeah, really, really, I was just kind of blown. I still am. Um, and it's one of those moments where I'm like, I did not, like, even in my impossible world, I didn't even conceptualize this. Um, and so, yeah, overall, it was really surreal. Um, also, even surreal in her passing, how my image was utilized and it like for BET to use that as the announcement, you know, and it's just like, wow. Okay. Okay. BET is a show, a channel that I would watch grow. It's just, yeah. Yeah. Wow. I don't, I don't think I realized that BET used that for their announcement of her passing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> that is, um, I mean, what a full circle. Yeah. Um, and again, I love that you said this could not have been part of my, you know, impossible, even like, mm -hmm. you know, vision. Mm -hmm. um, but you instinctively knew you wanted to do this job, whatever it was like. Mm -hmm. you, um, I love this, uh, the, the, the concept of what Miss Tyson said to you of uh, you all. Like, if you know you have to do something, continue to do it. Mm -hmm. um, that's, it's, um, it is, and especially coming from her, I mean, that yeah. just would be, like, what a powerful moment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, I mean, what uh, is there, we're, we're, we're running out of short of time here. Um, yeah. I can keep talking for days. <laughs> um, what are just um some other like maybe your final thoughts on for mm -hmm. other photographers out there um I love you know you talked about curiosity mm -hmm. um you talked about authenticity about you know being yourself trusting in the process so many mm -hmm. amazing things yeah uh, 
before we talk about where people can find you, uh, it's kind of some parting words of, of advice for folks. Yeah. Um, I would probably just break down the phrase of trusting the process because we hear that a lot. Um, but that includes every part of it, you know? So as I mentioned before, with like a pandemic, I had to trust that me not working was a part of the process. And it was like, it literally was because there were so many things about myself that I had to unlearn, um, acknowledge and sit with, um, especially that it, that came to my worth, um, what I'm able to accomplish. Um, my biggest thing was just creating a home for myself. Um, uh, I, one of the poems that I wrote in my journal is how, I've been homeless for almost 28 years because I never established a home in myself. And I had to create that home. I had to create a space that comforted me and nurtured me and just continue to fill in with me. And mind you, I'm not working. I have to use unemployment payment to like cover these bills. I had to like make sure and remind myself I'm a creative, even though I didn't want to touch my camera. But that is not outside of the process. It's still linear. Um, and so I just want to bring up, like, if you're in a space where you can't conceptualize anything or you're um, having a brain fart or there's just something that doesn't fit to what you were expecting, just take a step back and see how it's serving you. Even though it may not feel great, because growing is crappy. Um, it's the worst. Actively growing is crappy. Um, and I have this huge analogy, and I'll, I'll try to finish it up. But I, I'm like, because there's another poem, but I was talking about growing and how the plants don't tell you that when you're, that being watered feels like drowning, but you're being watered, you know? But it feels like, oh, I can't handle this. And like the fact that, you know, it's dark underground, like plants are underground and you don't see anything. You don't know where you are. And then suddenly you're emerging and you're just like, wait, I'm not used to these out of dirt challenges. Like now I'm interacting with insects and birds and people walking by. And so it's like, that's still a part of the process. Um, so that's like my, my takeaway. Cause that's literally where I'm at now where I'm just accepting every facet of what's going on in my journey. That is beautiful, uh, <laughs> Noemi. And, and yeah, um, just you're, you're able to visualize, I'm able to visualize with your words, mm -hmm. sort of that, just what that, um, means as a, as a human, um, right. in, in addition to it, as you know, thinking about a plant doesn't know what it's can't tell you it's drowning. That's mm -hmm. super, really beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and gosh, thank you so much uh, mm -hmm. for being with us today um, and speaking to our global audience. It was such a pleasure. Uh, where can everybody find you, follow you, connect with you, hire you, all the things? <laughs> I didn't even mention that you have this apparel line that you've, oh, you know, yeah. another side, another side hustle. Um, that is true. Too. <laughs> um, yeah, you can follow me on Instagram, Noemi Marguerite. Um, I usually just, you know, post random things on IG stories. You could follow me on Twitter if you want, even though I don't really talk about photography stuff there. Um, but yeah, I, I'm usually active on Instagram at Noemi Marguerite. So definitely check me out there. Awesome. And we'll have um, all of those links in the show notes, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, before we sign off, um, I want to give a few shout outs to people who have been tuning in. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Danielle Palmer, who says, this is helping my spirit, uh, which I love. Uh, we've got uh, Just a Human saying, um, it's hard to find a community as someone who looks to express themselves, uh, not only through explanation, but rather visual mm -hmm. and um and definitely when you when you're talking about finding community mm -hmm. uh and uh want to welcome alex keith who's watching us for the very first time thank you i'm glad mm -hmm. you found us 
um, and um, po folks talking about, I want to be able to live my truth as an artist and a person, and I want to be mm -hmm. able to be myself. So yeah. that is the goal. Um, thank you for sharing all of your uh, experiences mm -hmm. and uh, vulnerability and with us. Um, greatly appreciate it. Uh, thank for, you. For now, everybody, be sure to go um, follow Noemi, and we will see you here next time on Creative Live. Uh, if you want to check out everything that's coming up uh, here on Creative Live TV, you can scroll down if you're on our channel and RSVP for upcoming shows. And of course, this is the We Are Photographers podcast. You can subscribe, listen, uh, rate, and review anywhere it is you get your podcasts. Mm -hmm. And that will be the audio version. Uh, and we've got over 100 episodes of amazing creators for you to check out. So thank you again. And we will see you all next time. Signing off for now. Pursuing creativity is arguably the most practical thing that you can do. We humans are adaptation champions. That's what makes us human, our ability to imagine. The hard part is to look inside and say, what are my invisible beliefs that I have about money? I wanted to figure out how it actually worked. And you are really here because you became passionate about an idea. What does it take to capture great photographs of birds? You have to be grounded in your cameras. You need to understand the technology. Just like any band shoot, we're looking to capture great shots of the band themselves playing on stage. So the drummer shot, lead singer, guitars. How do you even prepare to shoot with your phone? And then we're actually going to go into the edit. Once you hit rock bottom, there's no place to go but up. You learn what, what's real. You learn what's needed. In astrophotography, there is a great deal more planning involved because you are literally shooting in the dark. We can't change others, but we can change our perspective. Wow, that's a good way to start the day. I had tears in my eyes. Hey guys, what's up? It's Chase Jarvis, founder and CEO of Creative Live. You all know that we have more than 2,000 classes and more than 10,000 hours of learning, inspirational, and motivational content on the platform. I'm super excited to announce a new experience on Creative Live. It's called Fast Class. You've told us that you're busy and sometimes it's hard to dive into a full class from start to finish. So, essentially we're now giving you a shortened highlight version of our top Creative Live classes. You can always dive into the full class with five, 10, or 15 hours of great content, but now if you're just looking to focus on a few of the highlights or wanna be able to skip quickly to something that really interests you, you can now get a shortened fast class version of that class. We're also thinking this might be able to help you explore a new craft and save time while doing it. This is a great tool to curate your learning experience to help create the life that you seek. So you're probably thinking, great, how do I access this new experience on Creative Live? That's easy. All you have to do is be a subscriber to the Creator Pass, and then all this is yours. <laughs>